Hi, welcome back everyone. Kevin Carpenter here and today I'm with Phil Nash. We're getting ready for CPP Con, just about a month out. Um, how's it going today, Phil? Uh, it's going pretty well here. Got uh, 30 degrees Celsius here in the UK today. Oh, 30 degrees. I would love 30 degrees <laughs> instead of, you know, <laughs> low 40s. Yeah, so, what are they going about? <laughs> So Phil is the original author of the C++ Test Framework Catch-2. He's mm -hmm. an independent trainer and consultant and a uh, member of the Standards Committee. And you probably also know him as the co-host and uh, producer for CPPCast. Yep. And so glad to have you to chat with you. Yeah, good to be here. So my first question for you, CPPCon's coming up. What talks are you excited to see? Or is there a speaker in particular you're looking forward to? So, um, I mean, as usual, I've got a lot going on myself. I've got uh, two talks to give and a, and a class. So I've only recently just had a quick look through the schedule to see what's even going on. But the very first talk on the schedule, uh, Dieter McCall's Creating a Sender Receiver HTTP Server did particularly catch my eye because obviously Sender's Receivers just made it into C++26, assuming it doesn't get pulled out again. And we had the recent uh, CPP cast episode on Sender's Receivers. And uh, some of the feedback we got was, you know, um, how hard it was to understand just from from that episode. And I actually made the comment, I'm sure we're going to start seeing talks on using senders receivers for actual practical applications. And here, the very first talk of the CVP con schedule is, is exactly that. So I'm quite looking forward to seeing how that, that turns out. That'll be cool. That is one that I have on my list, too, because uh, a lot of my day job, we're doing a lot with HTTP, you know, passing credit card transactions. Mm, so, yeah. But to your point, as you mentioned, you do. You have an academy class coming. I mean, since yeah. you created Catch 2, I can't think of someone better to learn TDD training from. So tell me a bit about your class you're doing. Yeah, so its uh, full name is uh, Accelerated TDD. So the, the idea being to try to accelerate you through the, uh, the initial stages of learning and, and practicing TDD where you make lots of mistakes, go down dead ends, and didn't, don't quite get it straight away. Uh, but you, if you try to actually start practicing TDD, you know, in your day job, uh, as soon as you think you understand it, that's when you're going to have problems because it's going to slow you down. You're not going to get the the results you expected. And so, so many people just give up and say, no, it just doesn't work because I have that experience. So, I mean, the, the main remedy for that, of course, is to to not do that and, <laughs> and to actually do little, you know, self-contained examples, call them catters. You've probably heard of those that you can practice TDD on until you get to a level of competency where that productivity comes back up, not just to where it was before, but even surpasses it. That's the whole point of doing it. And the idea of the course is to try to, you know, get get you off the path of some of those dead ends and get towards that productivity faster. So it's not going to completely eliminate that dip, but hope to accelerate you through it. So I took the class with you back in 2018, I want to say, mm -hmm. and I remember, you know, Snakes and Ladders was, yep. you know, we kind of built the game out and that was how I got my first introduction to TDD. How much has it changed for you since, you know, with the way you do the class format now? Yeah, I think that might be one of the, if not the first one, uh, maybe the second year that I did it. And the material is largely the same. I, I'm constantly evolving it, and, and every year it changes a bit. I'd say this year it's probably changed uh, the most since I, I started it because now I'm actually going out and delivering this as a, a course at companies on site a lot more. So I wanted to you know, keep it fresh and keep it more um, modular as well so I can adapt it to uh, to, to different uh, companies. So I've sort of broken it down in some different ways. But um, currently that snakes and ladders example, or shoots and ladders, I think uh, you can call it in the States, uh, that's still in there. Uh, that, that's still my, my first example. But then we sort of branch off in some different directions depending on, on uh, which course I'm giving. Well, I have to say that example, you know, I had never done TDD, you know, as I've said before, and that was a great example for, for getting into it because it just helped me adapt things. I was unfortunate that I missed the second day with you because right. that was the part where I would have learned how to more quickly integrate TDD with existing projects, which yeah. I'm sure you're covering a lot more of now too, yeah. Oh yeah, and, and that's why we, we do it as a two-day. In fact, I started doing it as a three-day workshop. You, you might think that actually TDD, there's not actually that much to it. In fact, I've got like one slide that basically tells you the whole thing and I explain it in a few minutes. But mastering it and actually, as you say, you know, integrating with existing code bases or what we call legacy code, um, yeah. going by the Michael Feathers definition that legacy code is code without tests. That's <laughs> 
that's really hard to work with if you're trying to create these completely sort of clean uh, enclaves of uh, <laughs> of code that you, you've written using TDD and or how to apply TDD to that sort of code base. So spend quite a lot of time going over various different techniques, approaches, mindsets, uh, everything, all, all the tools you're going to need to to actually work effectively with legacy code, which is the title of Michael Feather's book, which we, we draw on a lot as well. So quite a lot of that, um, mostly on, on day two, as you say, which you missed. So you need to come back this year. But uh, ah. And actually, I have time this year, so I'm allowed uh, to. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> So it's kind of funny because when I think about TDD with um, older code, or at least especially with some of the stuff I came across, the the TDD, I mean, aside from being able to do the testing and have good form with the code, it's like I really find TDD helps me avoid coupling, you know, yes. where I find really tight coupling because just the way that you end up doing it makes you think differently in general. And it's really mm -hmm. helped code quality overall. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, for me, that's the biggest win for for tdd it's not so much the testing itself sometimes the, the word test gets in the way obviously you get a large body of tests as a result which is great uh, but that's not everything but the the main thing is that it, uh, it it influences the way you design the code if you're putting the test first then you're going to get the signals from the code when you're not designing it optimally uh, and that mostly involves coupling as you say so the things that uh, don't belong together, you know, sticking together. Like uh, Kevlin Henney uh, uses this uh, this word adhesive code <laughs> that uh, sticks together to contrast with cohesive code yep. where the things that belong together do go together, but if they don't belong together, then they are kept separate. It's such a simple idea. Yeah. But when you're writing code, I mean, it, it never seems to come naturally. We, we have to really um, be disciplined and think about it, and then we still get it wrong. But with TDD, yeah. it sort of shines a light on that straight away. So... Uh, it's actually harder to write code with with heavy coupling than than not because of those three things going hand in hand. It really is, and it and that's across across all languages. I mean, because whether it was Go or you know the mm. the amount of places I've applied your training has been wonderful. But aside from your training, as you said, you're you're going to be a busy man at at CppCon because oh, yeah. you've got two talks going on: yep. modern C plus plus error handling, mm -hmm. um, and then a back to basics on lifetime. Correct? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, the error handling one, it's um, sort of a, a, another, not quite an evolution, more of a, a third step on a series that I started a few years ago. I did, um, let's see, what was it? Uh, optional is not a failure. It was the first one on error handling, maybe around 2017. And then a year or two later, I did uh, Dawn of a New Era. And I'm going to be revisiting a lot of the things that I talked about uh, in those talks. Uh, but just with a bit of a different focus and talk about what we can do today with the C++ that we have, particularly C++ 20 and 23, mm -hmm. uh, because they both bring some some new things uh, to the table there. Uh, so but also revisiting, you know, some of the older techniques, error codes, even, you know, reference arguments, um, Boolean returns. Uh, but then, you know, exceptions obviously yeah. do have a place. You know, how do we distinguish between exceptions and optional and stood expected that we have now? What's the monadic interface that the, that we have for those? What are its limitations? Um, and you know what else we can do? But also, because another hot topic this year, and I look through the schedule and it comes up in lots of places, even though it's not actually in even C plus plus twenty six yet. It's contracts. Oh yeah. You don't need the language feature to to have contracts in your code, though. In fact, all, all your code has contracts in it, but. <laughs> It's just a case of whether you, you make that explicit. But however you deal with contracts, there's um, there's an interplay there between contracts and error handling. And uh, I think historically, we, we've really blurred the lines. Um, and, and I think now we're starting to get sort of greater clarity on, on where those boundaries are. But mm -hmm. one thing I had not really seen talked about so much is where they actually overlap. And okay. so there, there's like single bits of code that either uh, has a, a narrow contract or it has sort of runtime error handling. And usually we think of those as being distinct. Uh, so I'm going to present some some techniques on, on how to deal with that as well. Nice. And then object lifetime. Mm. Yeah, well, this one, I, uh, I wanted to do this because I, I did a, well, a couple of blog posts, actually, a couple of years ago. Uh, so it was when I was working at Sonar, so mm -hmm. on the Sonar blog. And they were really about uh, the, the rules of um, rule of zero, the rule of five, of course, they're all okay. free. Um, but then sort of going on to some of the more advanced stuff where you 
guess you sort of break away a little bit from that. And um, I think uh, Peter Summerlad coined the the rule of uh, uh, Desdemova. Uh, we'll, we'll explain all that, <laughs> but uh, it's where you can just define one. I think it's a. Um, uh, I'm actually struggling off the top of my head. There's, there's one. I think it's just uh, maybe the move constructor. Uh, yeah. You define that as deleted, and then you get just because of the way the the defaults all work out, you get exactly okay. the um, special member functions that you need. Uh, and that, that can be worth thinking about as well. But we go over all the different sort of categories of, of types, you know, different types of managers and, you know, um, shared and unique ownership models, all that sort of thing, and how they relate to the special member functions. So not to bring Rust into the picture, but it is interesting because... <laughs> I we've uh, we've been learning it and using it at the company a little more and it is interesting. I see lifetime differently now. Like I, right, I'm looking right. forward to that talk just because there are lots of ways that you know managing our lifetime. I think especially as a new developer, you don't really. It, it wasn't something that was on my radar as much when I first mm-hmm. started out in C plus plus, but it makes a huge difference. Yeah, yeah, and it, it's something that we've had in the language since since the beginning really and it's evolved over time obviously we've got the extra uh, you know the move semantics yeah um we have things you know to do with uh, const and uh, all these little wrinkles that have come along along the way but uh, the, the basic idea is it's been there since the start yeah uh, it's a very rich language in terms of what you can express different ways you can do it and that adds a lot of complexity that you have to deal with right. and so it's it's an interesting back to basics talk because we're t- talking about something which can be quite tricky to grasp, mm-hmm. but it really is something that everyone has to master because <laughs> if you yeah. get it wrong, it's um, it can be quite disastrous. Yeah, that it can. Well, Phil, I want to thank you for your time and I want to make sure everybody knows that you need to sign up for Phil's TDD class, Accelerated TDD. Absolutely. Um, it, it's September 14th and 15th, so it's a pre-class. That's right. Yeah, it's so pre-, pre Before the pre, conference yeah. starts. Um, and still plenty of time to get signed up. Yeah. Yeah. So before right. the conference, before you're too exhausted from the conference itself, seems to be the best time to take on these new ideas. Yeah. I was going to say, I took it as a post and I was pretty burnt by the yeah. time. <laughs> you know, you, you really get loaded at the conference. Make sure you build in breaks when you're at the conference. That's for oh, sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I look forward to seeing you in Aurora. See you then. Thanks, yeah, thanks Kevin. <laughs>